Welcome back to Media Apocalypse, our series about threats facing journalism, news gathering, and the flow of information on matters of public concern in our democracy, and dedicated to exploring solutions, both in law and elsewhere, for preserving the press function. I'm Sandy Barron. Our guest today is Emily Bell, founding director of the Tao Center for Digital Journalism at Columbia Journalism School, which examines digital journalism's industry-wide economic trends, its cultural shifts, and its relationship with the broader world of technology. Recently, in conjunction with Columbia Journalism Review, Emily and the Tao Center launched a Journalism in Crisis project, leading, among other things, to a number of interesting webcasts that I highly commend to you. The majority of Emily's career, however, was spent at Guardian News and Media in London, working as an award-winning writer and editor, both in print and online, including editor-in-chief across Guardian websites and director of digital content for Guardian News and Media, which itself became a pioneering organization in live blogging, multimedia formats, data, and social media. Thank you for joining us, Emily. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Uh, I think it's fair to say that everyone on this webcast believes that good original journalism is critical for a healthy democracy. Local journalism specifically plays a significant role in the health of communities and their democratic governance. And there's a good deal of academic research that identifies problems that arise in communities when there's no serious local journalism. I'm interested in your views on how you see the most fundamental functions or tasks really that local journalism engages in that are important to that role of supporting democracy and democratic functioning of communities. Um, that's a great question, uh, Sandra, because I think, you know, we, we've often got lost in recent years talking about the sustainability of journalism and the crisis in journalism and the collapse of local journalism. Um, and, and that argument has somehow become very, I think, um, internally focused. And we forget that actually where communities have lost journalism or haven't had journalism for a long time, and in some communities have never really had journalism, not the journalism that they feel serves them. The, 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 the purpose of having a free press is sometimes a, a little lost. Um, and so reiterating like what exactly is it that it does, I think is really important. So the first thing to say is, you know, journalism takes many, many forms, but, but the journalism which is most important to democracy is the accountability journalism. And what we mean by accountability is somebody in your community who can ask questions of the people in power, who can interrogate your local government, your local education board, your local police force, um, and who can uh, keep records as well. So, you know, again, uh, as, as working journalists, we often think about what's next, what's the next story, what's going to get the impact, what's going to get the headlines. But you know, there are also really important things that, that, that news organizations have traditionally done in communities that are sort of slightly less glamorous, but really important. Like if you, if you lose a local newspaper now um, that doesn't find a home, you also lose the archive, you know, the entire digital archive disappears. So how do we make sense of what was happening in that community historically? It becomes a much harder mm. time. Um, having reporters in the community, so, you know, one thing I work on with, with my team is, you know, looking at the implications of things like automation. You know, there's an awful lot of data available in communities now that wasn't there before. Um, so do we really need reporters? This is a question I get all the time, particularly for the technology sector. What does a reporter do that you can't do with data and tools and an engaged audience? And I, I kind of always draw their attention to um, a nonprofit here in uh, New York City called um, nyccourtwatch.org. And the job of the nonprofit Court Watch is to send people to witness court cases. Because when you have a person in the courtroom, it changes, you know, the act of witnessing actually changes the dynamic of that process. And reporters change the dynamic of the process of 
uh, governance and the process of democracy when, when they're there, when they're present, because, you know, they can see things, they can record things, and they can also kind of interact with power as well. So, you know, if you're not sitting in the courtroom, you don't know whether the judge is paying attention. You don't really know whether the police officer is, you know, particularly friendly with the prosecutor. You don't really, you know, all the things that you are really kind of looking to an independent um, record keeping, reporting, inquiry sort of function for are missing if you don't have that particular type of accountability local journalism. And then there are a ton of other things that it can and should do. Um, you know, I'm sure like a lot of people on, on, on this webcast, I use things like nextdoor.com to find out what's going on in the few kind of streets around me. Uh, increasingly, I've noticed that people on a very hyper-local level pay attention to things like crime apps, like Citizen, which again is just automated alerts from the police radar. And then they go to next door to make sense of them. Um, when you don't have any journalists in that conversation, uh, you, you start to discover kind of how badly wrong things can go. And I have a, I have a great next door group. But for instance, the crime apps are sending alerts that are just not true. They're fake alerts mm -hmm. and people, you know, people put those into the system. Uh, there are no guardrails. So to find out actually what's going on in your community, you have this sense of information being everywhere. But then when you start to interrogate it, the, the number of kind of points of access which are trusted, which can give you context, which can ask follow up questions for you, are really limited unless you have access to good local journalism. And I mean, there's a lot of terrible local journalism, you know, historically that we've seen as well, so it's not all great. So I would say that those are, it's a mixture of this sort of social function, this cohesion, but really at its iron core, it's about accountability and, and record keeping. That's, that's great, thank you. Um, because I think that these kinds of discussions do get lost and are critical to what we are also looking at, which is what is it that we're trying to say? Right. And what is it we would choose to change? Right. With pick up that second piece of it. Since I have a sense of what you would choose to say, what would you change? So, so one thing that our research at the Tower Centre has shown up um, over and over again is that, you know, we talk about the importance of local reporting, but you have to have a qualitative lens on it as well. And we did some research in the suburbs of Philadelphia in, uh, you know, very sort of um, heavily African American communities. And you know, there's plenty, there was, the, the, historically there had been plenty of journalism in Philadelphia, but they were communities who were completely cut off from access to or representation in that kind of media. They said, you know, journalism is something that just comes and happens to us and it misrepresents our community. We don't really feel that we, you know, we, we see the stories that we want to see ourselves in. Um, we're a focus for uh, journalists coming and covering the crime beat. Um, but nobody who reports on us is from our community. So one thing I think we have to change is um, really the dynamics of sort of the business of journalism has meant that you've had this gradual consolidation and first of all, sort of people moving out of the communities that are not, or not living in the communities that they cover. And then secondly, sort of communities which are seen as being uneconomic for advertisers uh, and perhaps communities that don't feel an affiliation with their, uh, with their, with their local press um, are just completely sort of forgotten about. And we contrast, what was interesting to me was that we sort of had a couple of studies which contrasted, if you like, two really different areas. One of which was in um, the suburbs of Philadelphia, one of which was in rural Kentucky with, with again, you know, like a, a white rural audience and um, you couldn't have imagined I suppose demographically two more different audiences but their concerns about the media was exactly the same which is we're not represented you know we don't we don't see ourselves we kind of we we don't trust um what media says about us to be true we know it's not necessarily true and so I think the first thing you would change is is thinking about how 
to make sure that you build a model which is not you know which is 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 your community first rather than rather than profit first you know which has a kind of real social purpose to it um so i think that's one thing i think the second thing is that the model of journalism has really changed and again we've done studies um over the past five years which have shown you can imagine there's a lot of um there are a lot of startups in local journalism there are a lot of people yeah. making uh, buyouts and layoffs from big groups and starting again at community level who want to put right some of the stuff that perhaps you know the big chains and the um, vulture capital that's got in, involved in the ownership of news has um has erased so 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 that's great but then how do we sustain and support really small units to do that work because i think you know one of the one of the things we all know about journalism is it requires a lot of stamina um, and it requires a lot of institutional memory and sometimes it's a team sport and you can be doing a great job as a two three four five person shop but you don't have much resilience when it comes to taking on big business um, you don't have much resilience and many resources when it comes to perhaps fighting um against perhaps you know government that has more resources and is using things like social media to put out a completely different message uh so i think it's getting a balance what would we like we would like i think we need to change that balance between sort of centralized resources that are available to everybody whether they're legal uh technical um other types of support uh and then think about sort of actually distributing the, the reporting that's supported by that. And I don't, I think that people have sort of conceptualized that model, um, but it hasn't quite taken root yet, which is an, ex it's an exciting opportunity, but it's also something in which I think if we're really gonna support the models that we need, we have to shift away from expecting everything to occur in the kind of newsroom that most of us were familiar with over the past sort of 20 or 30 years. Are you talking about something akin to like a consortium, you know, whether you have a centralized admin hub that provides accounting and legal and all that kind of stuff, and then reporting sort of spokes off of it in a yeah. sense? I think that's a really good way of putting it, Sandra, actually. I think that um, there are people like Elizabeth Green at the American Journalism Project who's been thinking a lot about this. Um, one of my researchers mm -hmm. uh, or one of our fellows, Elizabeth Hansen, who's um, from uh, Harvard, she's been thinking about new local models of ownership. And I think there are a lot of smart people who are imagining that one way to tackle this is if you think about networks that maybe uh, help you with one thing, so maybe there's a non-profit network that helps local news with legal funds and responses. Maybe there is a network which has centralized um, technical knowledge and can help smaller newsrooms. In fact, there's a, there's a project out of Temple University which is just starting to do this, which is to hmm. help launch tiny newsrooms um, sort of technically uh, until they get to a certain threshold and, and, and then helps them be independent in terms of their, their technical kit. Um, and then you look at, you know, the reporting organizations like ProPublica, that's expanding kind of its network to be regional and local. It used to just have an office in New York City. Uh, now it has, you know, a number around, around the, the, the country. You have, um, you know, nonprofit reporting uh, hubs like the Marshall Project, which looks at the police, you know, the Trace, which looks at gun control. If you imagine some of those being networked into, you know, because not every small local organization is going to do all of this work. And sometimes they're going to need those partnerships and sometimes they're going to need different kinds of resources and different kinds of skills. But it's not economically viable to imagine that they are going to be able to contain all of those things, all of the things they need all the time in one place. So, you know, one of if, if you look at international and national journalism, I think one of the real success stories has been things like the ICIJ, which is the investigative network, um, or the OCCRP, which is, uh, you know, European based, um, uh, again, investigative reporting network. And we've seen, you know, small organizations help sort of really deal with big stories by distributing them kind of around the network we can imagine a sort of a local version of that which almost works in the opposite direction which goes to central resource for certain things um but then is it really able to sort of you know embed in its community
Um, and I think the other thing that we have to change is just predictability of resource. You know, that the commercial roller coaster that um, all newsrooms have been on is really only survivable if you're of a certain size. Um, and actually not just survivable, but you can see now bigger outlets doing really well. Uh, it's been so difficult for newsrooms to plan what advertising are they going to get? What support do they get from Google and Facebook? What, you know, what's, what's the paywall prospect? Um, you know, it's almost impossible to have a kind of a stable planned editorial presence if you are also dealing with that level of uncertainty. So some kind of system of subsidy, which is equitable, accessible and consistent um would be unbelievably i think transformative well, certainly for some american local news i would love to continue this i'm going to put a pin in the last statement you made and hope that it, one of my colleagues maybe follows up on it but for the moment to be fair i'm going to give ronelle a chance to ask you some questions as well uh thank you sandy um hi emily and thanks for being with us um uh, one thing that I was really excited about, about having you on to talk with us is that um, I, I want to sort of link together the view from the boots on the ground journalism space that you stand in with a lot of the conversations that we've been having with other folks over the course of this series about uh, various um, structural and legal solutions that people have floated. We've talked to, you know, experts in tax and antitrust and constitutional law um, and economists. Um, and uh, we hear a lot of sort of similar themes that come up in those spaces. They, um, they have different paths to the, to, to the same end result, but there are a couple of big silos of um, ideas that tend to get floated. And I think it would be really interesting and helpful for us to think about how you, from your focus on journalism, view a couple of these solution spaces. Um, the, the two that I'm especially interested in hearing from you about are um, models of public funding, uh, right? public rescue dollars, or something even more akin to sort of the BBC model of uh, sort of public media. Uh, and um, the space of philanthropy, uh, sort of thinking about uh, nonprofit and donations to try to support the, the local news, but also just more broadly, the press function in our democracy. Do you have um, thoughts that you can share with us that are sort of um, rooted in uh, what this looks like for journalism? Yeah, sure. So, so I'm from a European background and one of the big cultural differences, you know, I've lived in New York for 10 years and I still can't quite get used to the amount that uh, Americans talk about democracy and the lack of faith and trust they have in elected government. Which is, so it's almost as though those, those things are completely separate. Whereas in fact, in Europe, we see them as being the same thing. So this idea that you would have public media that functions well in the democracy is not alien in Europe at all. Um, sure. And over here, it's, it's treated with uh, real suspicion because America is, you know, it is a, it, it's a capitalist society. So the idea that the market is really the balance to government, federal government should be small, and particularly the government should not have any hand in ownership or control of media is, is, is culturally baked in. And when you look at places like um, Hungary at the moment with Orban uh, taking over, you know, even commercial media outlets, uh, you look at authoritarianism and how it, um, uh, you know, animates itself through control of media, uh, through, you know, alignment with social media. Um, this idea that you can't have an accountability mechanism, which is somehow linked to government, um, seems like a very reasonable uh, position. However, uh, you, know, I, I, you know, I take a slightly different view of that, which is it's the mark of a really democratic government which is interested in building democratic institutions to come up with mechanisms to actually sort of entrench this support for journalism and you know the BBC is a great organization and it was set up in 1922 not really as a democratic exercise in fact as the opposite it was uh, an engineering project which was there to make sure that you didn't have the radio spectrum distributed to you know the equivalent of pamphleteers it was a centralization sort of propagandistic kind of move by the by the government 
but over time it turned into you know a, a a social project and a kind of an article of belief that you could actually have something which was funded entirely by license fee payers and even though uh you know it's granted by royal charter it doesn't come from the treasury so there's a sort of a there is a, there is an attempt to keep it separate from state control and you know in post-war europe we've seen different models of public media cropping up it's it's sort of you know kind of just as um i think non-intuitive to say that space that public space should be only dominated by unregulated public entities as it is to say that government has no hand in it you know government's always had a hand in it in in the states until very recently you know it, it had a hand in um you know the the carriage by the post office uh let's go right back to that the post office act of you know 1796 um, spectrum licensing and obligations to carry and uh, the fairness doctrine, which we talk endlessly about, the CPB, etc. And yet somehow, you know, in the internet age, uh, there was just this assumption that abundance would sort everything out, that the market would sort everything out. And of course it didn't. The market has destroyed um, the producer class of, of, of news. So you have to have some sort of government intervention. Whether it is about restraint on the advertising market and antitrust, or whether it is about building um, accountable and separate new institutions that can act as distributors of funding, um, you know, whether it's to rethink the CPB and public broadcasting, or, or even use the existing public broadcasting infrastructure to help convert or support um, news in local communities. I think all of those are ideas that really, if you have a progressive administration that wants to make sure that we don't go through the same cycle that we've been through in the last four years, really make some rapid steps in that, in that um, direction, because we have to have a sort of a pro-democratic, pro-truth agenda in this. And then I think for philanthropy, you know, America is kind of, you know, incredibly lucky in that it has these philanthropic organizations which think um, in, you know, large and expansive terms um, and that fund, you know, I'm funded by philanthropic um, uh, foundations, mostly, uh, you know, we're familiar with them at places like Columbia and, and Yale. <laughs> they are our friends. Uh, you know, their involvement in journalism, again, like, like government, it's very helpful if it's properly stewarded and it has the right level of transparency and it's done in a, um, if it's done with good faith and with a, a sort of a sustainable goal. I mean, the interesting thing about local journalism at the moment in the States is that there are three really big funders, only one of which is a phil philanthropic uh, foundation, and that's the Knight Foundation. And the other two most significant funders are Google and Facebook. And I have some fairly strong views about their philanthropy, if you want to call it that, in this area, which is um, it's been incredibly helpful short term to news organisations. But it feels to me that that is actually a, it's a real problem that we have Facebook and Google making policy effectively uh, in this area and encouraging the parts of the news industry they want to flourish. Um, and this has happened without any kind of public discussion or, or, or debate at all. Yeah, oh, that's great. My second question sort of um, segues from the your expertise in the local news, uh, news desert space to your expertise in the role that the changing media landscape seems to have had on these bigger questions that we've been posing about the ongoing you know, survival of um, distribution of and news gathering and distribution of matters of public concern in the democracy. Uh, and I, I wanted to ask you to sort of uh, try to situate for us the primary role that you think the advent of social media has had on uh, the wider question, and one of the one of the things that I've been especially interested in is, you know, it those companies, um, particularly the big social media platforms, spent a lot of time early on in their existence emphasizing to us that they aren't news companies, right? That they aren't they don't want to be thought of as media companies, that they want to be thought of as tech companies, and uh, that the, the sort of our old way of thinking about news companies doesn't really map onto what they do. Uh, but the data shows us that the reality is that loads of us get <laughs> a huge percentage of our information on matters of public concern uh, from them, that they are in fact the new public square. And so I'm wondering um, if you 
can sort of draw the link between these two themes that you study, uh, the question of the, uh, the diminishment of local news uh, and um, the growing power of um, uh, content-based decision-making by some of these platforms and help us know what key questions we should be thinking about that connect those two themes. Yeah, I think, I mean, that's, to me, a, a, a lot of what you're asking, Ronelle, is like absolutely at the center of um, how we approach this, this problem. Um, so the main impact really of the large scale technology platforms is just the removal of advertising as the support mechanism for the vast majority of media. So if you think about it for 100, 120 years, um, uh, news in local communities had one source, essentially one source of income and revenue, and that was that was advertising. And almost overnight, uh, in historic terms, so you know, in the space of ten years, all of that revenue has shifted from local news into larger platforms. Um, and it's essentially Google and Facebook. It is it is the duopoly that that that, that have dominated that. So we know what the origins of it are, and I'm not going to get into this, you know, there's a lot of sort of like, it's not really the platform. So it doesn't matter at this point, it does not matter whose fault that was. This is no fault issue. It's just sort of where we are. Um, and, you know, because we have lost, because we've lost both um, the means of support, but also sort of an understanding and, and, and a way of thinking about how we do communicate to communities and how we communicate amongst each other during that period as well. So I think it's it's not just a financial shift, it's also a cultural shift. So if you go from, you know, uh, thinking about your local radio station or your local TV, cable news, which is still enormously important in reaching certain um, parts of the community, particularly older um, news consumers, uh, that, you know, that's such a different model to having things passed at rapid speed, you know, among a group of people who are maybe on Facebook, they might be on WhatsApp, they might be in, um, they might be on next door, uh, where you see all sorts of links uh, to material, you, you don't know why you're being targeted or what you don't even know you're, that you're being targeted. You maybe just think, oh, well, I'm seeing stories about the area that I live in because it's the area I live in. Uh, you know, that the, there's a real sort of opacity to, to that level of um, news provision, which does, which, which, which the platforms themselves could not conceptualize what effects it would have because they are not experts in this domain at all. Um, and interestingly enough, you know, people who have been studying these, you know, kind of phenomena for years in communication studies departments of universities, and these very kind of arcane and largely sort of ignored, you know, theories about how we communicate with each other and what sort of impact it has, have suddenly become incredibly important to democracy, <laughs> and, you know, and again, you know, they are very underfunded versus, say, the computer science departments that have a very sort of, they have a, they have one view, of how distribution works, which is without friction and on a sort of equal playing field. Um, and, and so because this transition has happened so quickly and platforms did not want to conceptualize their role as being gatekeepers of information or shapers of information, because to conceptualize it would do two things. First of all, it would open a can of worms, which is enormously expensive. So just to steward any of those conversations, you know, and, and secondly, because, um, you know, yes, it's about sort of not wanting to carry liability for, for what they carry. Yes, it's about their business model. Yes, it's about aggregating huge amounts of data. I think it's also cultural. I think that these companies genuinely, genuinely believed at some level, if you create frictionless systems, then good things will happen in the marketplace of ideas. And uh, we know that that's not true. I mean, we know it's not true in financial markets. Unregulated financial markets are a disaster. You know, bad money always drives out good, always. And speech in this market is the same thing. So at local level, you, you've got a problem which is rooted in that technological change. And now you have companies who I think as public relations um, initiatives are trying to solve it themselves. So, they're, so, so what they're doing is they're saying, you know, we will, we will sprinkle quite small amounts of money um, quite broadly uh, to support journalism because we believe in high quality reporting. And, and you see so many initiatives um, about algorithm changes that will, you know, put local reporting higher in the mix. So you see it more on your newsfeed. Um, you see initiatives to uh, 
pay for more local reporters in uh, small communities coming from Google and Facebook. And all of it feels sort of like, you know, it's got a joined up strategy behind it, but it really hasn't. Uh, so, I, so I feel that sort of you, you have this, this real problem at the moment, which is, you know, the kind of public relations imperatives of the big platforms to keep regulation at bay is really standing in the way of a much more important sort of set of structural changes that we could be making. I'm sorry, I don't know if that quite quite answers your question, but it, yeah, it absolutely does. Um, and um, I'm going to sneak in. Uh, we're, we have a two, we have a two question um, rule around here, and I'm sneaking in a third because I just want to um, because it's one that we all always ask, um, and I want to make sure it gets posed to you. And I think it's best for it to get posed to you right on the heels of what you've just said. Um, this question that we ask everybody is a question that we call the magic wand question, which is just um, uh, setting aside all of the real world limitations that exist. Exist, uh, politics and culture and um, uh, behaviors of, <laughs> of certain market actors. Um, if we handed you the magic wand in the space in which your research is most focused, what's the one thing that you would wave the magic wand to do, uh, to, to effectuate and to bring about in order um, to, to, to create a better world for the flow of information on matters of public concern? So something that I could do, which was actually totally doable, it's just that nobody will, is um, put uh, restrictions around targeting, micro-targeting uh, for certain messages, particularly for political advertising. Uh, so I think that, that that's just a very simple change you could make, which I think would, would, would alter how, uh, first of all, it would alter sort of economic distribution um, in some of the ad market. And secondly, it would stop what we've seen, you know, th this real sort of erosion of democracy where nobody is quite getting the same messages or they are being divided and um, kind of activated uh, in ways that are, you know, sort of alien to the idea of a joined up kind of bipartisan conversation. So that's one thing. Um, if I had a bigger wand and I could wave it in a very grandiose way, uh, I, I think you would want a national endowment for, um, you know, you want a national endowment for knowledge of which of which news is a really important part. So, you know, as I say, a steady um, a steady pool of funding, uh, which has also kind of some institutional strength and ambition um, to say this is the long haul. You know, we've had 120 years of one commercial market dominating news that's now failing. Uh, we know that sort of the nonprofit uh, uh, model has a lot of promise in it, but we need a runway of maybe, you know, 50 years, uh, maybe more to actually kind of do that sort of reconstruction work. And, and, and we don't have any guaranteed funding and it has to be something which is, you know, locked up and it isn't sort of challengeable. And you have some very rich companies at the moment who are making a lot of money out of the information market, you know, the public sphere. Um, perhaps they should be, you know, if they could all break off a couple of billion, you could actually create something which would not have a real effect. So I think that that's, that would be my more ambitious and more ideological move. Yeah, it's really, really interesting to me what a huge percentage of people who get the wand handed to them really uh, are asking for what, what boils down to sort of the same thing, which is resources for and a commitment to um, a body of shared objective truth, right? I, I, think that's, I think that's really, really interesting to me. And people are stating it in slightly different ways, but it does seem to be the thing that gets um, sort of reiterated to us. Um, Scott, I'm going to hand the baton to you. Hi, um, thanks so much. Thank you, Emily, for being here. Um, can I, can I, can I ask um, you why you didn't? So, one suggestion that has been made is to follow something akin to the Australian model of requiring Google to, you know, social media companies to disgorge some of their revenues and share it with um, with um, various news outlets. Um, I, I mean, what what's your um, reaction to this to this move? Do you think it's a do you think it's something that other countries ought to try? Are you optimistic about it, um, or do you think that this is just bound not to work? Well, I think you know. Um, 
it's a long time since I was a law undergraduate because we only we do law as a degree on first degree in uh, Britain. Um, but I'm familiar, still very familiar with the concept of, of making bad law, which is, you know, this idea that something which might work uh, and you do it hastily and lawyers hate it because the foundations of it are just wrong, um, like building a house in quicksand. Um, have I got that right, Scott? That is, that's, that's, the, that's the bad law. For, don't make bad law. Um, yeah, in general, we shouldn't make bad things in law. <laughs> Ideally, bad is, is something to be avoided. <laughs> Ideally, but the idea of bad law is one which is just conceptually a little flawed, even if it actually has good immediate outcomes. So I think that's, you know, kind of thing. And, and so I look at Australia and I think that Weirdly, it's a sort of almost the opposite, which is a sort of bad motivation for possibly making good law. Um, so, you know, the, the issue in Australia, I think, is so important because the fundamental question is who gets to decide these issues? Does, does the marketplace and particularly extremely large corporations get to decide how a society should construct its democratic institutions or do the people and the government, you know, does, do, does the government as the representatives of the people get to do that? So, you know, that's the tension. And we see that tension in European regulation as well. So you can see Angela Merkel last week said, uh, it's a gross abuse of power that Twitter would ban Donald Trump from their platform. And people were like, oh, I'm quite surprised that Angela Merkel thinks that. Said, well, you know, she's she is a head of state. So you'd but, like that to be next on the list. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but you know, but again, it is exactly the same thing as the Australian uh, question, which is what what lay beneath what Angela Merkel was saying was this tension. You know, companies should not decide, governments should decide. And again, it's this fundamental cultural kind of schism between more or less America and the rest of the world, which is who do you trust more? you know, people who can be elected out of office um, or companies that can't. Uh, and so what Australia, I think, is just a touchstone for that. The, the problem with Australia is that what is animating the government in this case is Rupert Murdoch and his press ownership. And when we look at the alignment of power, and again, this is a sort of, a, this is one of the problems that you have with commercial media, which is, it looks like an accountability mechanism. It employs journalists. Uh, you know, Rupert Murdoch has 40% of the press market um, in the UK. Uh, he's a very powerful sort of TV operator. He operates Fox News here. Um, but when those accountability mechanisms are actually aligned with government, then uh, they become, you know, a tool of oppression, just like everything else. You know, <laughs> they're not, they are no longer accountability, they are enablers. And so I think people feel very conflicted about Australia because actually, you know, it is exactly the right thing for governments to be doing at the moment, which is challenging this idea that a Google can decide how to make a society sort of interact with information and, 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 and decide how markets are going to be shaped. Um, but the, the counterbalance to that is, it's sort of, you know, will, 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 will the money that's hypothecated from Google actually go into a system which needs much more radical reform, which is a, an old system of corporate media? So I'm not, I'm not really fence sitting here because I, I'm, I'm, I think I absolutely believe that it should not be the companies that are deciding this. And, we're, and in America, I think they really are deciding it at the moment. And there isn't enough focus on that, which is, you know, we sort of think about, oh, what are we going to do about, you know, their rhetoric is fight misinformation, you know, hire some fact checkers, uh, sprinkle some money on journalism, but there's, they don't have a strategic plan and they shouldn't have a strategic plan for how this will look because that should be something which is taken by, that those are decisions for civil society where we think about things like equity and we think about things like access and we don't just think about, you know, is this actually going to be sort of commercially viable? So um, when Renell asked you the magic wand question, um, your answer went to uh, revenue sources, basically what we wanted, it, which is really fair because like you can't have news production and distribution without money. Um, so that's obviously something, that's a problem that needs addressing. I was 
curious what you think might be um, your preferred solution for um, the problem of disinformation. Um, uh, and I wonder whether the two things are connected in the sense that like whether you have, um, when you have a, um, a critical mass of local journalism, that is in some sense much harder to, to play because you, you know people in your block, around your block, in your neighborhood, in your community. And so um, there it's, it's it, it maybe is easier to control. So I was wondering what you thought about um, this issue. Yeah, I tell you, one of one of your one of your good people at Yale, uh, you know, Tim Snyder was writing in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago after the attack on the Capitol. Um, he mm -hmm. mentioned uh, the recession of local news as being a key factor in creating some of these circumstances. A lot of our research at the moment is focusing on sort of systems really of um, influence um, and systems of influences usually where you get kind of harmful disinformation, you know, everything else. Sort of, I'm not too bothered about nonsense on the internet that just circulates because people don't know quite, you know, what's right. That's always been an issue, right, in society, rumour making and sense making and what have you. But I think these sort of systematic, the systematic delivery of uh, messages which um, are really aimed at creating kind of real life um, and often sort of damaging actions. Uh, and we've seen local news being used or, you know, the livery of local news being used by hyperpartisan, by PACs um, uh, to get into local kind of communities to uh, deliver messages that look like they're neutral, but they're not actually neutral. Um, and for disinformation, I think, you know, the first thing we have to do is move away from this idea that we're fighting, you know, misinformation war or fighting an information war. I actually teach a class called um, information warfare reporting and the first thing I do is say you know so there's a there's a, a great writer called Peter Pomerantsev who wrote a fantastic book called this is not propaganda uh, which lays out some of these sort of disinformation tactics around the world and he makes a really important point which is you know the first thing we have to do as journalists is not become inherently uh, you know sort of cynical suspicious and conspiracy driven um, so, so, you know, you have to keep yourself out of the headspace that says everything is misinformation all the time. You can't trust anything. So that's so, 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 so in fighting it, I think, you know, it's become a very singular focus. It, it suits politicians. It suits the platforms to talk about this. They very rarely talk about shoring up journalism or building more libraries or changing the education policy or closing the income gap. And, you know, uh, maybe we talk about fighting misinformation because we don't want to talk about racism, you know, we don't want to talk about poor people, we don't want to talk about all the things that create division in society. And we want to think only about these systems that we think are fixable, which actually they're not really fixable. But you do have to, I think, have a model which prioritises truth and evidence-based material. And one of the problems with the, you know, the algorithmic distribution system is that it doesn't really do it doesn't really do that. And a further problem is that, you know, the, the kind of the money which is now moving into this space is coming more from, I would say, you know, kind of bad actors than it is coming from good actors. So corporations, uh, political parties, you know, grifters uh, are all able now to manipulate information and manipulate sort of audiences um, for their own benefit. You're gonna have to have one way or another much more focus on you know, what, what, what the platforms call content moderation. It's very difficult uh, because you have speech laws here and you have the First Amendment, or rather you have the First Amendment. Um, but I think that, that, that sort of globally we're beginning to think about this idea of harms and systems that deliver harms. Uh, and perhaps our information systems need to be assessed and um, they need to be risk assessed. You know, we've just seen this incredible story about the GameStop shares <laughs> um, going through. Now, you know, it, those are systems there which have been allowed to run um, without thinking about, you know, who's harmed by this. So, so what, what's actually happened is um, it looks like a hedge fund is going to be protected and students who've put, you know, kind of a couple of hundred dollars into a trading app will not be protected. 
how do, how do we re how do we re rig that? How do we actually make it? Um, we don't force platforms to take down material, but we force them to assess the systems that they operate for risk and harm, harm to democracy, harm to the truth. Um, so it's a really, I think we have to get into a really different way of thinking about this. And we have to get away from the, if we wipe everything off the platform all the time with AIs or whatever, we will eventually win the misinformation war. That's not gonna happen. You know, you need so many different initiatives in different places. Um, for that to even become kind of, you know, to, to, it's, it's going to take, I mean, that is the, that's going to take us the longest time. I think it's going to take us even longer than finding a solution for um, supporting journalism. So, so is this, because um, we have to wind up, is, would this be a fair way to characterize your response is that to say like there are these two problems. One is the provision of high quality journalism, especially at the local level and the problem of disinformation. These aren't really two separate problems. They're really a linked problem. Um, and, and and that like we, we have to, it would be most helpful probably if we address them together, um, uh, though solving one problem is not gonna solve the other, they're, but they're mutually reinforcing solutions. I think that's absolutely right. I think that we, you know, we, we talk in, binaries too often in some of these problems we talk about the mainstream media and the social media and you know we're all swimming in the same sea <clears throat> and we haven't processed what those linkages are uh, i'm going back to the wand question i'm going to say one of the, one of the things that i would wave the wand for is <coughs> excuse me is um just seeing more data from platforms so that we know you know like how can we even know at the moment what's happening you know who is reading what where when What's the effect? You know, we, we know so little about this world at the moment when theoretically we have a lot of data at our disposal. <coughs> Excuse me. I have to take my deep state radio mug and have some tea. Um, I, um, it's a perfect way to segue back to uh, Sandy. Thank you so much. Thanks, Scott. Well, and my job is to say thank you and sign off, but I fear I have one more question and I'm hoping my colleagues will and you will tolerate it. Uh, 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 it. It goes back to the first magic wand question or first magic wand answer. And, uh, and that is you talked about funding and you talked about perhaps a big endowment. Um, one of the issues that dogs every conversation that we as a community of lawyers and media lawyers and media itself live with is who is the press? Who are the journalists? Who do we privilege, whether it's the reporter's privilege, whether it's access to Air Force One, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, any kind of privilege that the press seeks or obtains who gets it in this world? Now, I don't know that that's something that you and your colleagues are thinking about, but if you are, I'd be interested to know what your thoughts are. It's a, I mean, that's a great question as well. And in fact, I've just been writing a piece for CJR on, on this um, subject and looking at how taxonomy of technical um, systems like platforms, how they categorize news, how do they decide? Uh, and you know it's not it's a it's it, it is a messy business and it should be a messy business because we should always be thinking about what does this include i think we can say i'm sort of quoting um jennifer grigel who's a uh, professor up at syracuse and she has looked at um state media labeling for uh <laughs> with great effect and you know jennifer's point would be we know what journalism is not, so it's not propaganda. Like that's not propaganda. And some of these definitions, um, is political advertising dressed up as news journalism? Would you privilege something that you could prove was a political advertising pack funded? Might do some good reporting, but does it really need to be supported by a nonprofit news, um, uh, news, news fund? Uh, so we can make some of those distinctions, you know, and you can make them without trampling on people's rights, and you can make them without violating the First Amendment. We already credential journalists through police departments, which again, I find absolutely bizarre that the police could get to say, 
who, who is a journalist and who's allowed access and who isn't. What about unions? That used to be a, if you, you know, if you have an accessible union system, the guild used to be one way that you would uh, identify people who were engaged in this uh, process. Um, it, I think, you know, I, I think you have now affiliation and it's a bit like art, isn't it? It's like, you know, <laughs> I know it when I see it or pornography, you know, I, don't, I, can, I can define it when I see it. I think most of us know what a good faith news organization is, but maybe this is a, a, a good moment for reform as well, which is perhaps if you seek funding, you should actually require um, responses to readers who have complaints. Maybe you should require absolute transparency of funding sources. You should require uh, much more transparency of the publishers themselves, and perhaps they would have had to practice if they were operating in the commercial sphere. So I think you don't necessarily need to start saying you're a journalist, you're not a journalist, you're an activist, etc. I think that you know anyone who signs up to the principles of open, honest, good faith accountability reporting should be somebody who could be funded by one of those um, organizations. I think if you don't sign up to those principles, if you don't want to correct things when they're wrong, if you don't operate on a truth-based uh, good faith system, then it becomes pretty obvious over time that you are not really going to be part of what we want in that, um, in that space. Uh, I think, you know, where we've landed is this, um, and again, the flat space of the internet says we don't want any distinctions around content whatsoever. What's got us into this mess to some extent is saying everything is content um, and not saying there's civic uh, communication, there's public information, there's journalism, there's advertising, there's propaganda. You know, this is, this is we do have to go through, I think, some of that sort of fundamental recategorization. Look, I really appreciate it that you were willing to take a stab at that, and and in I'll fact, get, I'll probably get fired for, for saying. Yeah. That. Thank you very, very much.